Welcome to the Command Ops Game Concepts movie. This movie is aimed at those who are new to wargaming or who are new to the Command Ops or game engine. In this movie, we will look at the fundamental concepts underlying the game engine, namely high fidelity modelling of space and time, macro management, the command process, and orders delay. When we began designing the game engine, back in 1995, we wanted to provide a simulation that was as realistic as possible. One that put the player in the role of a commander of a corps, division or brigade, making realistic decisions based on the information that would be available to a commander at that level and at that particular time. It had to capture the process of accessing the situation, developing plans, issuing orders and reacting to developments. It had to model orders delay and force the commander to think and plan ahead. It had to acknowledge that an operational commander achieved his objectives by relying on his subordinate commanders to do their assigned jobs. In other words, an operational commander generally macro-manages rather than micro-manages. One of the fundamental conclusions we came to was the need for high fidelity when modelling space and time. These are key components to any wargame simulation. Traditional turn-based, hex-based operational level wargames use low fidelity modelling with a turn representing several hours or days and a hex grid measuring kilometres across. We opted instead to use one minute time intervals and 100 metre movement grids. This allowed us to model the effects of small differences in time and space that when compounded over a large duration or a large area make a real difference. Using 100 metre movement and terrain grids allowed us to model more accurate maps and deployment of units. Units can deploy along the forward edge of woods to be able to see and fire on the enemy in the open at long range. Or they can deploy in the middle of a town to ambush the enemy at close range. Unlike traditional hex based war games, where units occupy the hex they are in and jump from one hex to another, units in command ops can occupy multiple grids and move in small increments of one metre. But probably the most noticeable and significant difference is in the modelling of time. In traditional turn-based games, the game is run by processing a series of steps or phases within a series of turns. In command ops, it is processed by a series of events. Every minute, all units process their current event and schedule their next event for the next minute. This event-driven process is used in what is commonly referred to as real-time strategy games. But unlike these games, you can pause the game and still access data and issue orders. Moreover, events are processed continuously as fast as the machine's processor can handle or as set by the player. Most of the time this will see game time being run at an accelerated rate compared with real time. E.g. you can run a whole day of game time in one hour of real time. That's why we refer to this system as pausable continuous time, or PCT. In nearly all other war games, you have to issue orders to each and every unit. And if they're turn based, you invariably have to do that each and every turn. This micromanagement is both unrealistic and tedious. Real life commanders do not issue orders to every unit under their command, nor do they have to repeat this process every step of the way. Rather, they issue orders to a few subordinate commanders and let them manage the forces assigned to them. In other words, they use their command structure and macromanage. For macro management to work, the commander has to be able to trust that his subordinate commanders will do a reasonable job. In real life, the competencies of subordinates can vary quite a bit, and that is why good commanders keep a watchful eye on their subordinates. For this to work in a simulation, the artificial intelligence, or AI, needs to be powerful enough to do a reasonable job of managing subordinate forces. And having such an AI lies at the heart of command ops. Yes, the AI will sometimes get it wrong, just like real-life subordinates do. But overall, you can trust it 
to do a reasonable job of managing your subordinates. In real life, commanders tend to command two levels down. E.g., let's take a typical army command structure of a corps comprising three divisions of three brigades of three battalions of three companies. The corps commander would typically issue orders to brigades, while the divisional commander orders his battalions. This means that a commander would typically be ordering around nine or so line subordinates, plus several support subordinates like artillery and engineers. However, in command ops, there is nothing stopping you from issuing orders to each and every unit. You can micromanage if you wish, it's just that you don't need to. And once you learn to trust the AI to do a reasonable job, you'll find that you will only tend to micromanage in a few critical spots just like a real commander does. In this example, we're going to be highlighting the power of the AI to manage your subordinates. We're going to give a simple attack order to KG Holtmeyer, which is a German armoured regiment. We're going to see the AI manage the subordinates from that simple attack order right through the move to the forming up place, the reorg at the forming up place and the assault. Okay, we select the regimental headquarters and we attach a panzer battalion as well. We set the first waypoint at the forming up place and the second one at the final objective. We set the formation to line, artillery direct support only, and maximum aggro. And we then start the game running. You'll note the individual uh, battalions move in road column to the forming up place and here you can see their individual unit tasks. Once they get to the forming up place they'll shake out into assault formations. The line units will be forward. The headquarters and mortar units will be to the rear. The mortars will provide fire support to the assaulting line units throughout the battle. HR means the start of the assault and they're away. You'll notice that uh, each of the units are advancing in line and they each have their individual assault objectives. Now, all that was done with a simple order. With this power and trust in your subordinates, you as the commander are now at liberty to focus on what real life commanders focus on, i.e. what is the enemy, where is he, what's he doing, how can I counter his plans, and how can I achieve my objectives. Macro management allows you to think ahead, to anticipate developments, develop contingencies, monitor those developments, and if need be, react to them. For many players of traditional turn-based hex war games, this requires a bit of a paradigm shift in the way you approach the game. Please bear with it. It won't take that long to adjust the way you play, the way you command. After a little while, you'll find it difficult to go back to micromanaging everything. To achieve an AI powerful enough to manage subordinates, the game engine must model an effective command process. We opted to use as the basis for this Colonel John Boyd's famous OODA loop, observe, orient, decide and act. So the AI knows how to observe the environment and the elements that comprise it, space, terrain, weather, friendly and enemy units. In other words, it is situationally aware. It knows how to orient or to put things in perspective, especially in relation to its objectives and the constraints of time and space. It knows how to assess the situation, develop options, choose the best one, and from that develop a plan and issue orders to its subordinates. Moreover, we have further developed the framework by differentiating between major and minor decisions. In real life, a divisional commander will develop a full operational plan and issue orders maybe once every couple of days. 
However, in between these major decisions, the commander will monitor and react to developments, making minor adjustments along the way. So we've enabled the AI to assess, plan, order and react. Reactions vary from simple actions like halting, firing, calling in fire support, retreating and bunkering down, to more complex ones such as bypassing enemy or launching quick attacks. In this example, we're going to explore the command processing by subordinate AI control forces and how they react to the enemy. We're going to focus on Task Force Davidson here. This is a recon battalion and it's part of the US 1st Infantry Division and these, the rest of its forces are deployed along this line here and the enemy have already launched an assault and have penetrated the line overrunning the position here. We're going to order Task Force Davidson to move to Huningen. Its options for doing so are a little limited by virtue of the terrain. There's a major river here which prevents movement by motorised forces and similarly the woods along here also prevents movement to motorised. So its avenue of approach to Huningen is down through the river valley here but you note that the enemy forces are here as well. If we go to the tools path, we select the Task Force Davidson headquarters and we choose a quickest unit path route, we can see that it chooses to move along the main road up to Buchtenbach, down through to Bullingen and on to Huningen. Now this would take it right through the centre of the German assault, which is not a good option. So let's see what Davidson does when we give it an order. We're going to order it to move to Huningen. We're going to tell it to use a safest route. This will try and use whatever cover is available and avoid the enemy. I'm going to make sure it doesn't rest because it's still at night time. Dawn's not for another two hours. It's only six o'clock and dawn is at sunrises at 0800. We're also going to allow it to initiate attacks or to bypass depending on the circumstances. What happens now is that Task Force Davidson will receive its orders then it will develop its plan and in doing so it will determine the best route it can to Huningen. It will then determine the best formation that it should use for its move and it will then allocate its subordinates to a particular role within that formation and then it will send orders to them. So let's look what happens. Right, we can see here that the route it's chosen, rather than the quickest route that we had before along the main road, it's chosen to use this minor road here and then to hug the wood line and then divert south around the enemy concentration and then come back up into Bullingen and on to Huningen. So, not a bad route. Let's have a look at its planned task and we can see here that it's chosen to use road column formation. This will see its units moving in a column with one unit at the front and the rest following behind. When we assigned Davidson the task, these, these were the units under its command. Now, when he's developed his plan, however, he will have reorganized and reassigned the units under his command into different groupings. We can see that by setting the player structure to show the current structure. And here, for instance, you can see that the first 
Recon Platoon is now subordinate to D Company 745th Tank Battalion. If we have a look here, the subunits haven't received their orders yet, so we'll let the game run for a little bit and the unit will shake out and then we'll have a look at the formation in more detail. Alright, force is now moving along. We can see that D Company here, if we have a look, we can see that it's the advance guard for the task force. This means it's out in front. And its subordinate unit, the first platoon, is advance guard for it. So it becomes in effect the vanguard or the very forward unit of the whole battalion. We have uh, the tank destroyer unit is the main guard. Now these are a good unit to have as a main guard. These comprise um, the M36 tank destroyer uh, vehicle which is a open top tank mounting a very powerful 90mm anti-tank gun. The recon platoon has armoured cars and these are ideal for reconnaissance work. They provide enhanced detection of enemy forces and the similarly the D company here is light tanks, Stuart light tanks and these provide good effective firepower against enemy infantry or light vehicles or light armour that it may encounter. So that is a good composition for the advance guard, another good choice for the main guard and you'll see at the back here we will have the uh, engineers of the rear guard. So all in all a good choice for its formation and for its allocation. We'll let the game run now and we will come back when the uh, force gets closer to the enemy. Alright, we've come back into play and we can see Task Force Davidson moving now towards the enemy area. I'll just pause it there and we'll just have a look at the threats that it perceives. We'll click on the platoon and we can see these strong bright red threat lines meaning they're a very big threat and they should be too. This is a uh, this will be a uh, German armoured uh, company here uh, and uh, that will be a real threat to this uh, armoured car uh, platoon. So we uh, have enemy in sight we will have a look at their reaction uh, route status. We can see here that the green up arrow indicates that everything's normal. Um, you can see over here this this unit here has a green square which means it's halted. Um, this one over here has a orange square which means it's retreat recovering. If it was an orange arrow it would be retreating and if it was a red arrow it would be routing. Um, here's another unit that's retreating and here's these units here which are red square are out recovering. They're basically out of action and not going to participate in the battle uh, for a, quite a while, a number of hours. So we'll proceed on. Now this blue engagement indicator indicates that the uh, light tank company has begun firing. We'll click on that unit and go to its data and have a look at its log. And we can see here, yes, that it's it's engaging and it's halting. So if we were to check its routes, its route status, we could see that, yes, it's halted um, and it's firing. And we could have a look at its threat indicators and again these these units here are its primary threat and there's also an enemy um, motorized self-propelled flak unit over here. So things are starting to hot up. We'll continue again. We'll notice our recon platoon has uh, destroyed an enemy unit here. We'll just zoom in and 
we have uh, destroyed a, an enemy anti-tank unit here. So that was uh, good work. The units are receiving fire. Under fire here and engaging. So far things are looking okay. But now as the... There we go, we can see that uh, the recon platoon has uh, been forced back and is routed. And I'll just stop her there. And we can see now that Task Force Davidson has decided, in fact, to um, launch an attack. In this case, it's a probe. A probe is a form of attack in which the unit, when assaulting, if it encounters stiff opposition, may break off the attack and withdraw to preserve itself. So, not a bad option given the likely strength of the enemy in this area. So this is seeing the unit form up, and it's changed, we'll stop it there, and we'll just have a look, and we can see now that in fact it's changed its current force structure again, and in this case we'll see that the recon company is now in charge of the assault, and we'll have these other units under command, and the A Company engineers have been uh, lagging behind and rerouted to come south. And that's a good option too because that avoids it coming down through this death zone here. And uh, the first uh, recon platoon which is out of action has been uh, left out of the plan for the moment. The assault is now starting, and we can see them being engaged and receiving fire. When you see the little orange indicator, that indicates that the unit is receiving fire, and if it goes red, it means they're suffering casualties. We're receiving heavy artillery bombardment here. And we've in fact been forced to retreat. It's the second unit to retreat. This may force Davidson now to change his plans, but no, they look like they're rallying back. At this stage during play, we could intervene and issue orders for our artillery to fire in support or direct another force to uh, support this with another attack maybe from down this direction. But for the moment we're leaving Task Force Davidson to its own devices. It looks like this force here, which has uh, retreated and now uh, uh, opted to defend, if we have a look at Task Force Davidson, we can see that our assault gun unit has now been dropped down into the support role. This unit is a uh, support unit. It can take, while it has some tanks, these are in fact. Um, one of mounting 105 howitzers, they're a support weapon. They provide direct fire support, primarily for anti-personnel type of work. They're not really an anti-tank vehicle. They're not really an assault vehicle as such, although they can be used in that if, if pushed. But in this case, they've been de deployed in support, and they will now provide direct fire support against the enemy targets and support the rest of the attack on its way. As 
as you can see here, there are no shortage of potential targets. Unfortunately, the rest of the force has uh, been forced to uh, withdraw. may just stop it there as our engineers have uh, met with some unexpected German opposition coming from the south. But I think that this so far has demonstrated that the AI can develop a plan and also react to the situation and respond by changing and modifying its plan as it goes. For your information, after a further six hours, Task Force Davidson has in fact secured his objective for his probe. How's that for tenacity? A key requirement for the AI to be effective is that this command process has to be scalable from core to company. This is affected by using a process that spirals down both in terms of the force structure and in terms of the planning doctrine. For example, when a force is ordered to secure Town X, it will first ask, am I there yet? If so, then defend. If not, then move. If move an enemy in the way, and we are strong enough, then attack, else bypass. Each of these decisions invokes the development of another plan based on the appropriate doctrine. Another key aspect is that the decision making is generic rather than scenario specific. In most other games, the scenario designer will have written certain scripts to govern the behaviour of certain units based on certain conditions occurring in that specific scenario. Such scenario specific scripting can give the semblance of a good AI. However, once you recognise the conditions and the responses, it becomes very predictable and ultimately less challenging. In Command Ops, the AI is situationally aware and develops its plan based on the situation it finds at the moment. Thus it rarely does the same thing twice, is less predictive and provides a greater challenge. As I mentioned earlier, command is exercised over time, the fourth dimension. In Command Ops, when a commander issues orders, it takes time for these to be transmitted to the subordinates. It then takes more time for them to assess and develop their plans, and if they have subordinates, then the whole process must be repeated down the line. The amount of time varies according to the level of force. Divisions take longer than brigades, which take longer than battalions. It also varies according to the efficiencies of the commander and the staff at each level. Hence, good commanders with good staff can get things moving a lot quicker. Also, motorised units process orders quicker than foot units. The reason for this is that they have more radios and being mobile can organise themselves a lot quicker. In this example, we're going to have a look at how the differences in orders delay manifest between different forces. We're going to first have a look at the 39th Fusilier Regiment. This is a fairly low quality unit and it consists of two battalions, as you can see here. And if we have a look at the command values for the force, for the headquarters, we can see that efficiency wise it's not too bad. Um, staff quality is pretty good. So this is not such a bad example, um, but it's going to take this force approximately 70 minutes for it to cascade its orders down the line and start moving. If we select the, um, the 901st, this force again is a regiment consisting of Panzer Grenadier units and it's uh, a fairly good unit. If we have a look at its um, values here for its 
leadership we can see that its efficiency is about the same but it has excellent staff quality and efficiency and its force delay is going to be just under 50 minutes so that's almost that's a 20 minute difference between the two forces now let's show that by we'll issue a simple defend order to this regiment and we'll have it defend in situ meaning it'll stay put where it is and similarly we'll issue the same type of order to the 39th regiment in situ and we'll run. Before we do so just note the unit information box on the 901st icon has gone pink meaning it's processing orders and what we'll see as we run is that once the orders have uh, been received the force will take some time to process it at its level then it will dispatch them down and we'll see its subordinates um, their unit information box will turn pink as well we'll just select this force so we can see. Now you can see the battalions here and some of the direct support companies have all gone pink because they're directly beneath the um, 901st and because of defending and it's at night they're, they're, they're going to uh, rest but in the meantime the 39th if you notice only the battalions have got it now the companies come in so it's taken them that extra time before they actually start doing their plans. We're still waiting on these companies here while everybody else has already implemented their orders. The difference in efficiency doesn't have to be all that great to make a significant difference over time. If you have two battalions where one can process its orders in say 60 minutes and another in 50. If they make five decisions per day then the one that can do it in 50 is going to end the day one complete cycle ahead of their opponent. This is referred to as getting inside your opponent's decision loop. Once you can do so you gain the initiative and your opponent is always reacting to your developments rather than the other way around. This is how you achieve surprise on the battlefield. As a commander, you need to be aware of the implications of orders delay. You need first to appreciate that it will take some time before your units will actually respond to your order. If they're currently moving and you order them to defend, then they'll continue to move till the order is processed. Because of this, you must avoid issuing a series of quick fire orders to the same force. They will spend all their time processing orders you need to issue orders sparingly. You also need to think ahead. As part of the planning process you need to identify possible developments, work out options to respond to them and the events that should trigger them. Then you need to monitor the actions looking for those triggers and then be decisive in your response. It can take a bit of getting used to so in command ops you can set the amount of orders delay at the start of a scenario from none to painfully realistic. We recommend though that you start with the realistic setting. With pausable continuous time, orders delay and macro management there's quite a bit to get used to. Just keep looking at things as you would in real life. Command Ops endeavours to be as realistic as it can. I strongly recommend you go through the tutorial movies. See you then.